Hey everyone and welcome back to the Harry Potter review series. And as you can no doubt tell from the title of this video, we've kind of gone backwards as we've returned to Sorcerer's Stone on the PS1. Now, why exactly is that? Well, you see, my original Harry Potter reviews are about to turn 10 years old next summer. And they were made when I was just getting my start on YouTube. And as that goes, there are plenty of editing issues and a lot of other things that I didn't like about them. Particularly that I was using a standard definition capture device at the time, so the quality was kind of eh. My scripting was all over the place too, and I always hated how the later titles, like specifically the HD Harry Potter games, their videos were like 3-4 to four minutes or something, or 5 minutes. I think one of my Chamber of Secrets reviews for the PS1 version was like 3 minutes, and sometimes I look back at that and I'm just like, really? I made a video that was 3 minutes? Seriously? And I've, I've gone way longer with some videos now, I mean, you've seen some of my most recent videos, they've gone more than 10-15 to 15 minutes, so I really felt like I could give it another go. Also, because a few months ago when I upgraded to a 4K capture device, I saw how nice older games render on it, and I just had to test it out on one of the Harry Potter games, and it was quite the difference. If you watched my um, update video from a few months ago, you definitely saw the side-by-side -side comparison, or rather it was sort of overlaid, and the colors really pop now with the 4K thing. It, it, that's not going to make it look dramatically better, obviously. This is a 20-plus year old game we're obviously going to be looking at, and some of them are even, well, a little younger than that, but still. We can't really fix the quality overall, but we can make it look a lot sharper and brighter than it initially was. And for some reason, the Roxio software that I was using for the initial reviews, it kind of made everything darker than it initially was. So, you know, again, early days and there was tons of mistakes. I've, I can literally list off a bunch of issues I've had. I think in the Social Storm review, I think I say it the same line twice. Ironically, nobody commented on that, so thank you very much for not, you know cutting me off at the legs on that one. I think even my Sonic Adventure review from a few years ago, I think that speed is all messed up. It's going way faster than the audio is. That's why I'm restarting some of these reviews over again. If you remember from my update video, we're going back and starting over again because I kind of want to get a, a fresh start. I feel like I'm in a better place now with my editing software and my uh, capture devices. I can get better quality and I can probably give better quality videos than what I initially was putting out a decade ago. So here we are now. So these reviews won't replace the originals, I'm not going to pull them off the channel or anything like that. Rather, just think of these reviews as sort of remixed, enhanced director's cuts of sorts, and I'm going to be looking at them a little bit more in depth than what I did in the standard reviews. And anything that I felt was either too harshly critical or overly critical for the wrong reasons that I was trying to do to be funny or just being stupid at the time, I'm probably going to cut out. You'll notice that a lot with this review for the most part. So we begin our journey through the Harry Potter video game series with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, of course. Released as a tie-in to the film, the Sorcerer's Stone game was actually what got me interested into the Harry Potter series as a whole. So I was around 10 years old at the time and was recommended to read the books, which were just starting to gain popularity at the time. Eventually, I did read the first one, and after I finished it, I didn't really think much of it. I mean, I didn't think it was, like, garbage or anything like that, but I guess my younger self just couldn't really see what it all looked like. I was kind of used to, like, chapter books with, like, three pages to a chapter, not, like, 16 to 20 with no pictures or nothing like a little thing to help me see what it was. So I guess my younger self was just kind of stupid and I couldn't envision it. But I liked it enough that I asked for the video game for my birthday that year, which was right after the release of the film. And after I started playing, I couldn't put it down and suddenly I was immersed in this world. I wanted to read the next book, the book after that. I think only Azkaban was up, out up to that point, so I think I only had the first three. But yeah, I just took a great liking to it right after I started playing this game. So weird. I guess, like I said, it just took me to seeing some representation of the world of Potter, both in the games and in the movie, to really get me into it. But we're here to review the game, so let's get started. This is actually a pretty faithful adaptation to the film version of Sorcerer's Stone, not the book. On the note, each version of Sorcerer's Stone was developed by a different development team, and that's why they're all drastically different from each other. Argonaut Games handled the PS1 version, and they were actually known for their work on games like Croc and some Disney games like The Emperor's New Groove, which I also reviewed. Shameless plug. And fortunately, Argonaut went defunct after their last game came out, and that was a tie-in to that god-awful Catwoman movie. I actually played that game a few years ago. I actually almost made a review of that a few years ago, but my footage got corrupted. Hmm, maybe in the future. Most of the important beats of the narrative are told here through narrative sections using illustrated still images. The opening narration gives the backstory of Harry's life with the Dursleys and how he received his exception letters to Hogwarts, you know, the whole thing. Yet, oddly enough, the game doesn't seem to recount as to why Harry is living with the Dursleys. Yeah, they show Hagrid dropping him off at the doorstep, but, like, there's no mention of Lord Voldemort killing Harry's parents. So I hope you read the book, or saw the movie. In fact, Voldemort doesn't get name dropped until, like, the last 20 minutes of the game. It's it's a bit odd, because let's say you hadn't read the books when this came out, and you hadn't seen the film yet. Wouldn't this be kind of a tad confusing? I mean, it's not the end of the world, though, that he's not mentioned. I definitely went a little tad overboard in my original review about what a mistake that was. I think I was just trying to be overly angry for no real reason. The core story found in Stone is here, with a few details that just get omitted. Like, the troll breaks into Hogwarts, but we never learned that it was Quirrell that let him in, nor is Hermione in the girls' bathroom because of a fight with Ron. The set pieces are here, it's just how you arrive at them are slightly tweaked. 
and this is really the beginning of that. Every game in the series will omit details or randomly springboard you from one plot development to the next. In some cases it's slight and in others it becomes a bit painful to see and we'll point them out as we go along. I understand that the films have that two hour time constraint to fit all the important plot details but this is like a game and I feel like there shouldn't really be a constraint on how long that has to be. I guess the problem is that movie based games tend to have that shorter development cycle so there's less time to work on stuff. But still, when you have the time and effort to create new stuff in the game to bulk out the narrative, you should be able to fit the actual plot lines that came from the film. For instance, early in the game, Malfoy kidnaps Hedwig and you gotta go through this opening little tutorial section to rescue her. And this is not from the book or the film, and yet, it exists here. Now you could argue that this was just added to house the game's tutorial. But why not just put that tutorial during the scene when Harry goes to Diagon Alley at the start of the film? But you can't do that because the game skipped over that part covering it in the opening narration when you started. So why not just have that scene at Diagon Alley? It would be a great time to get the player used to casting spells, moving around the environment, interacting with things. I mean, you do go to Diagon Alley at the end of this game for another plotline that the game just made up, which makes it even more confusing as to why you don't go there at the start, since my first thought would have been, well, the developers obviously left out Diagon Alley at the start because then that's more stuff that they would have to create on top of the Hogwarts map, and there just might not have been development time to craft all that stuff. Although funnily enough, the Game Boy Color version has you starting in Diagon Alley properly, and the remake of this game on PS2, Xbox, and GameCube starts the opening tutorial stuff here at Diagon Alley as well. But enough of the story. After all, good gameplay can make you forgive the story if the game is engaging to play. The game is an action-adventure platformer, though it's probably more heavier on the platforming than the action, I guess. Harry has an auto-jump similar to Link from The Legend of Zelda, so there's no controlling your jump completely, though there are ways to shorten it by just pulling back on the analog stick a little bit. You also are allowed one spell to use at your discretion throughout the entire game, and that spell is Flipendo. You can't use any of the other spells at will, the rest are all context sensitive. So you'll need to find the specific thing in the environment in order to be able to use those spells. Throughout the game you're going to be collecting the spells Wingardium Leviosa, which levitates objects, Incendio, which can burn or stun plants, although it's mostly just used to burn things, Aviforz, which can transform these eagle statues into birds off these tables, which allow you to get up to higher ledges and stuff. And finally, Vertimilius, which casts a bright light to reveal these hidden platforms that you can't interact with otherwise. And whenever you come across one of these context-sensitive spells, you have to perform a little button minigame before casting the spell. So, for example, when you come across Wingardium Leviosa, you get to control the object that you're levitating and drop it with Triangle. When you cast Incendio, two circles with symbols on the controller will revolve around a large ring, and a ring will also circle around this too, with the goal being to press the correct symbol from the controller when the circle and the ring match up. Casting Aviforce just has you pressing the X button when it reaches a marker at the top of a circle, and with Vertimilius you don't do anything, you just press the button and it automatically lights up the platforms. It's a bit disconnecting that you have to perform each spell differently. Not only that, but you have a limited amount of time to use these context spells. If you mess up with any one of the performing things, you have to start all over again. It seems strange to have to do any sort of extra button pressing minigames to perform a spell since I don't have to engage in this kind of thing when I cast Flipendo. So it kind of just makes me wonder why I have to do that for any of the other spells. I mean, can't we just do every spell like Flipendo? I mean, that seems like a fine gameplay mechanic. The spell minigames aren't annoying or anything, although the Incendio one can be if your timing's off. It just seems like a bit of an unnecessary step. And adding insult to injury is how often you'll be using some of these spells. Flipendo is pretty much used for everything in the game. You want to kill something, you use Flipendo. You want to move that giant block to get up on a ledge, you use Flipendo. You want to get rid of that spiderweb, Flipendo. Every single thing in the game can be Flipendoed. But you'll use Wingardium Leviosa once in a while to lift up objects and place them on pedestals. Incendio is mostly used in the Forbidden Forest sections, but it's really Avalfors and Vertimilius that really got the short end of the stick here. You see, you basically use these spells like once or twice in the whole game. The room I'm showing you right now on screen that pops up literally right after you learn Vertimilius in the Defense Against the Dark Arts class is the only area in the game to use this spell, I'm not even kidding you. There's really no point in learning the last two spells since you barely use them. I can't really remember off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure you use Avifors like maybe twice. M maybe three times, but that's it. You'd assume that by the end of the game there would be some sort of challenge area to use all of the spells from the whole game, but there really isn't. And yeah, I know what you're thinking, there's already a set number of challenges with the whole thing that protect the stone at the end of the game, but there's like added rooms there too that didn't exist in the book, so I feel like they could have just milked it a little more and, you know, had you using every spell to reach the final area, but alas, that's just not here. You just always keep relying on Flipendo. It pretty much does everything when you think about it. It's not even really an official spell from the books. I mean, I think it's essentially a stand-in for Stupefy because at this point in time, that spell hadn't been named in-universe, so... Yeah, ironically, Flipendo disappears from the games after a while anyway. Now, while performing the spells might seem a little bit unnecessary, 
learning how to use them is even more mundane than it ought to be. So you have to play another little mini game where a tiny dot flies around to the four buttons on the PlayStation controller and you have to press the correct button when the dot reaches the symbol. If you miss one of the symbols, you have to do the sequence over again, and there's usually three or four patterns you gotta perform. And you gotta do each pattern three times each. And I just really don't get this since you don't use these patterns when you're casting the spell, so what was the point of playing the little follow the pointer game? The pattern serves no actual purpose in the actual spell casting. The system on PC kind of made a bit more sense in this regard. See, the lessons there had you draw out the symbol with your mouse cursor, and then the symbol would appear on objects in the game that you could use the spell with. So that system was sort of connected in a way. What you were drawing matched up to what you would then see in the environment. The spells in the PlayStation version are just represented by different twinkly lights to distinguish between the spells you get to use, but you still gotta press the buttons and do the mini game to cast the spell anyway. And this has nothing to do with what you learned in class. Another interesting comparison to the PC version is that after you learn the spell in that version, you get to go through a challenge chamber using the new spell you just got in addition to ones you already have to solve puzzles and make progress to get to the end. Now in an eerie moment of foreshadowing, this is actually how the classes will work in the next two console games. But again, it makes you wonder as to why the heck the PlayStation 1 version doesn't have these challenge chambers. Nope, here after you learn the spell, you then get to go into a side chamber, perform the spell once, and then you get immediately booted out of the class and move on to the next part of the game. I guess I have to kind of chalk this up to the fact that the games were being handled by different development teams, so obviously the PC team had a more creative development cycle when it came to these sections. Another questionable implementation is the Invisibility Cloak. I understand that portraying the cloak just as how it works in the books would essentially break the stealth segments, since what challenge is there in Harry being permanently invisible? So instead the designers tried to add a bit of a challenge here when using the cloak. You see, you have to collect tokens of the Invisibility Cloak which are hidden around each room, you then find a key to open up the locked door, though you have a limited time in the cloak as it doesn't last forever. These sections become puzzle-like in that you have to figure out how to approach the cloak and then use the remaining time to grab the key and reach the door without being seen. This is obviously the best they could have done with such a mechanic. Even I can't really think of a way to make this more engaging. Thankfully there's only one section where you get to use the cloak, so this mechanic doesn't really last long enough for it to be enjoyable or annoying, it's just kinda there. A fun side diversion to everything is when the game actually lets you fly on a broomstick. You get to take part in the flying class relatively early, and then you can do Quidditch training before gaining access to playing actual Quidditch matches. The flying controls are solid, and it's easy to climb and dive in addition to making sharp turns. The Quidditch matches have you flying through three sets of rings before it'll let you attempt to catch the snitch. You'll zip all across the pitch while dodging bludgers and the opposing team seeker, who seems to only show up during the second set of rings, and then he kind of flies off, I guess, to go to the little wizard's room, because he never comes back. There's no score on screen or anything, so the focus is just on making it through the rings, and once you do that, a bar will appear at the bottom of the screen and you have to press X when the snitch enters Harry's hand. Quidditch might not sound like it's a very deep minigame, but it really doesn't have to be. It's fun to stop exploring Hogwarts for a few minutes and jump on a broomstick and just fly around for a while. The game also lets you take part in the final challenges guarding the Sorcerer's Stone, and this section is a lot of fun, if a little easy. The first part against Fluffy has you playing music to each head in order to get Fluffy to go to sleep. Then you have to battle the Devil's Snare. This involves hitting the tentacles in a certain order before you fight the main plant. This is made a bit simplistic as the fact that the tentacle order is given to you as each one is lit up like a Christmas tree, and the main fight has you just moving out of the way and then firing Flipendo as it tries to crush you. You finish off the plant with Incendio, just pray you don't mess that up because if you do, the plant regains health and then you gotta start over again, so it can be annoying. Next up is the winged key section, and this plays out like a Quidditch match. You chase the key through rings until you fill up the bar at the bottom of the screen, and then you catch the key like you did the snitch. Then comes the chess scene, and rather than just play chess, which if you've seen my other reviews of the other versions of this game, the developers seem to never want to go with that simple option. I can only assume that they figured that kids didn't know how to play chess. This part instead has you moving to different spaces on the board and getting the pieces to attack each other. It starts off easy, but that third board can get a little frustrating. Also, it sucks because if you die on the third board, you gotta do them all over again, so yeah, it can get tedious. Finally, there's the troll room, which was cut from the film, since in the book the troll was asleep and Harry and Hermione just walked past, so it's kind of surprising that it's here. Anyway, the troll here has just woken up, and you have to actually charm objects out of the way so it doesn't wake up fully and then kill Harry. While this might be the simplest challenge out of the bunch, it's definitely my favorite. The anticipation of moving each object to the side when you know the troll's like creeping up right behind you, it's a nice thrill of adrenaline. Technically, the potion room is here as well, I guess I should say, but it's a simple shell game with three little things, and you just play it once and that's it. There's no riddle or puzzle to try to figure out which bottle is the right one you need to pick. My final pet peeve is how the game seems to have a bit of a fascination with time limits. 
Most things the game asks you to do has a time limit attached to it. If you want to fly through all the rings in the flying class, it's timed. You want to get to class, it's timed. You want to cast those context sensitive spells, it's timed. You want to collect a certain number of objects, it's timed. I just feel like the game should have slowed down a little bit because the game is very short. I mean, it's about like three hours total altogether, and it rushes you through a lot of it. So I'd rather them slow it down so I can at least enjoy my time with it rather than feel like I'm being pushed along to the end. And rather than show how much time is left like by using numbers, it uses this blue bar that empties downwards, and the bar is accompanied by the most ear-piercing tick-tock noise that increases in frequency the less time you have on it. And it's enough to drive you up a wall and break any concentration that you had in these segments. Aside from the main story, there are a few diversions to keep you busy. First are all the famous Witches and Wizards cards. These are hidden around Hogwarts behind bookcases and in secret passages. Sometimes they're just out in the open, and other times the passages contain a small minigame that you have to complete. One of these minigames involves you stunning giant candy in first person mode for some reason. A few have you engaging in this little puzzle game that you have to knock all the cauldrons back onto the fire. And finally there's one where you have to collect a bunch of purple beans within the time limit. Collecting all of the cards grants you a bonus card with Harry on it, and it actually allows you to play an extra Quidditch match against Slytherin. However, good luck collecting all of the cards thanks to the insanely annoying minigame at Gringotts. See, when you arrive at Gringotts, you have to collect each form of currency. You know, the nuts, the sickles, and the galleons. You do this by navigating the minecart to grab each of the coins and avoiding the barriers that cause you to drop coins. Why Harry's money is left on the track and not in his vault, I'll just chalk that up to game logic and move on. You have to do this minigame, like I said, for each coin, so that's three separate rides down. Just doing this alone is fine. It can be a tad challenging. I definitely remember getting stuck here a lot as a kid, mostly because I had bad reflexes and I couldn't react fast enough to the barriers. But overall, this isn't actually too bad. It can be fun. However, again, there are three wizard cards that are attached to this minigame, and getting them feels like someone kicked you in your knuts while cutting you with a sickle as you drown in a galleon of water. To obtain them, you have to grab all the gems that appear on the ride down. Now, to get the gems to appear, you have to grab all the coins in a specific sequence. You'll know when these are coming up because you'll see the gem icon behind the coin icon telling you that they're coming up on the track. If you miss one coin in the sequence, you get no gems, and you fail instantly in order to get the card. Oh, and you can't pause and restart the thing, you have to finish the ride before you try again. And the icing on the top of this fresh hell is that should you fail and have to restart, you have to be very, very careful when you talk to the goblin at the end, because when he asks you to try again, because if you don't press yes, you return to the hall, and you can't retry it ever again. So I hope you saved before you entered Gringotts, if that's the case. I really tried to do this for you guys, to show you the extra Quidditch match, but I just could not do it. I spent at least three hours on this ride from hell. And I think I, I might have gotten the first one, but then I didn't save the game when I got the second one or when I failed the second one and I accidentally hit the no button. Yes, I actually was stupid enough to slip and hit the wrong button because I wasn't paying attention because I was just getting ready to do it again and I just accidentally flicked the joystick and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still in pain about that. Look, I'm sure this isn't impossible, but some time and some practice I probably could get it down. If you memorize the route and how you're supposed to move it around, you probably can do it, but I just don't have this time to waste. The second big collectible are the Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Beans for Fred and George, in exchange for passwords to open up portraits around Hogwarts. And these portraits are usually right near Fred and George, so they're not that hard to find. Although I still think the one that's down in the dungeons is pretty pathetic. It's literally like two steps from them. Like, come on, you couldn't even put that down a hallway? There are four different colored beans, yellow, blue, green, and red, and each one gets you a different reward. This is made easy since the game is nice enough to have more beans of each color than the amount requested, so you can't get screwed by missing a few beans. Though the side quest isn't really worth the effort since the rewards are... kinda pathetic. The yellow beans give you access to the Nimbus 2000. It's interesting considering that in the film that's not how Harry got his Nimbus 2000 when he became a seeker. Hedwig did give me a broom earlier in the game but what, that was just some random broomstick that she found? I remember playing this as a kid and I got really excited at this part because I thought that that was the Nimbus 2000. I mean, I know that this first broom that Harry gets doesn't quite look like the one from the film but you know... I just figured it was the graphics and they couldn't render that handle thing. I mean, how was I really supposed to know that this was hidden away somewhere? I mean, a better question is why did they choose to hide this thing? Like, shouldn't they have picked something else? I mean, did Fred and George steal it from Professor McGonagall before she could give it to Harry? This is like if one of the bean rewards was the invisibility cloak. It's like, Harry got the room as a gift, he shouldn't find it in some random chamber for collecting beans. The Nimbus is something that should have just been given to us as part of the story. The reward for all of the green beans is Quidditch armor, which is completely useless since you'll rarely get hit with bludgers, and even if you do, it doesn't take that much damage off your health. And again, there's only two Quidditch matches in the main game, three if you manage to go through that fresh hell and Gringotts and get the extra match, but trust me, it's not really worth it. Collecting all the blue beans gives you a famous Witch and Wizards card of Dumbledore, so the reward here is 
a tad redundant as it's nothing more than another card, and again, if you couldn't complete the Helen Gringotts, this really won't matter for anything because you'll never have all the cards anyway. The final reward for the Red Beans is an upgrade to the Flipendo spell, which turns it red and allows for faster charge times. Now this one sounds like the best reward out of the bunch, but sadly there's a catch. You see, by the time you collect all of the Red Beans, it should be right after the troll chase to the girls' bathroom. And you would think that right after that finishes, you could go talk to Fred and George. In fact, in an ironic twist of fate, they're actually standing two inches away from you when you finish the chase and you pop out of the door. But instead, the minute you do come out of that door, you get dragged into a Quidditch match with Ravenclaw, and then you automatically get dragged into Diagon Alley to go to Gringotts to get the money to find supplies to help Hagrid heal the sick Norbert, and then you return to Hogwarts only to get more story narration that explains how Harry, Ron, and Hermione got caught trying to give Norbert to Ron's brother Charlie, and then you have to serve detention in the Forbidden Forest. So by the time all that gets done, you're at the end of the game, and the only thing left to do is to do the challenges protecting the Sorcerer's Stone. So you can really only use the spell in the last few rooms of the game, and there's not that many enemies in this room, so you really only end up using this thing in the final battle against Voldemort. The presentation is a good combination of areas replicated from the film and newly created areas just for the game, though only a few of the areas are replicated from the films, like the Gryffindor Common Room, the Great Hall, Hagrid's Hut, Diagon Alley, and the Quidditch Pitch. Most of the new areas feel like they would fit in with the areas from the film, so there's not like a giant creative difference. Trust me, if you played the Game Boy Color version of this game, yikes, they went completely in the other direction with the design choice there. I know it's a handheld device and you can't get that much out of it, but trust me, night and day. One lacking design choice to the school is the lack of other students. The PC version had students walking around and it definitely added to the atmosphere, but here the school's empty for the most part and it definitely hurts. Character models leave a lot to be desired, particularly in the faces. The faces are textures wrapped around the 3D model of the character's head, and in some cases it, it comes out pretty bad. I mean, Dumbledore's face kind of merges in with the texture for his beard, and the same can be said of Hagrid's. It's like you can almost see the line in the model that the texture's laid on. It's kind of distracting. Especially since this is a late PS1 game, you think they would have gotten a better handle on that. The score is composed by Jeremy Soule, and it's mysterious and charming. The main theme from the title screen is, to me, just as iconic to these games as Hedwig's theme is to the films. The theme for Quidditch and flying around are also some of my favorites. There's also a few areas where the music is strangely absent. It's mostly in rooms around the castle, which I'm only really taking an issue with because I really love Soul's score here, and I constantly want to hear more of it. Overall, while Soul's Stone doesn't completely fire on all cylinders, I still have a ton of fun playing it. I definitely have replayed this more than some of the later games in the series, and way more than other movie tie-ins that I own. A big reason why I really wanted to re-review this game was because I felt I was kind of unfairly harsh to it the first go-around, I think since Stone was my first review on YouTube, I felt like I had to be overly critical. I've learned over all my videos now that I should just be myself and true to how I feel about a game. You know, I shouldn't have to act a certain way. Is Sorcerer's Stone perfect? Nah, far from it, but it's a perfect entry point for the series to grow from. There are some weird ideas here to be sure, like the button minigames for spells, and the lack of using all the spells in creative ways, but all I can say is thank god the PC version exists and it had the challenge chambers to give them that idea for the sequels to use. On its own, though, it's a fun trip to go through. I mean, it always throws something new at you. One minute you might be learning a new spell in class, and then traveling around Hogwarts before you're being chased by a troll, and then thrown into a game of Quidditch. So I can confidently say that the gameplay here is never stale, as you're never doing the same thing for long. Sorcerer's Stone is an adequate first step for the series to begin with. So thanks for watching, and join us next time for the Harry Potter review series.